Hello, everyone out there in cyberspace. Uh, I am Dan Milner with Blurb, your trusty host who's been here pretty much every month for the last 30 or 40 years, I think. We've, done, we've been doing these webinars. So I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me and everybody can see me. And if you guys can, can you go to the chat on the right-hand side and let me know where you are chatting in from and that you can actually hear me? Because you never quite know on these things. Uh, and so far, no one has written in. So here we go. Here we go. Minnesota, Ireland, and Cleveland. Cleveland and Ireland are almost identical as far as I know. Okay, we got Glasgow, San Francisco, Germany. There you go, Laura. You got a, you got a fellow German coming in. Uh, let's see, Plymouth, UK, Williston, Florida, Canada, Bill Bow. Okay, so every, like I do normally, I'm going to allow a couple of minutes for people to show up here. And then we are going to get started. We have an amazing guest today, and I will introduce her. And um, she's got a really beautiful presentation to go through, which is uh, poignant for all of us today. And again, let me see here and check. Oh, we got a Santa Fe. All right. That is my, that's Elsa in Santa Fe. That's my part-time home, Elsa. And uh, Sherry from Saskatchewan. I just love saying that word, Saskatchewan. That's worth doing a webinar right there. So uh, let's see here. All right, let me give it a couple more minutes. Let me just tell you guys a little bit of a story here at the beginning, which Laura and I were just talking about before this thing happened. And then I'll introduce Laura, but I, I'm, I'm giving people a little, a little more time to sign in here. So back when I graduated from photojournalism school, which was back in the, in the early 90s, when I went through four years of photography school, guess how many business classes I took during four years of, of school? So write into the chat and tell me how many business classes do you think I had I started school in, let's say, 1989, 90, and I graduated. Ah, Renee hit it. Susanna hit it. Exactly right. Zero. Not just photo business classes, but business in general. I had no classes whatsoever. It was 100% focused on imaging, which is great, and I needed it because even when I graduated, I wasn't very good as a photographer. It took me a while to figure it out. But today, or a few short years after I graduated, the Internet arrived, and the Internet flipped the paradigm of my life being in the hands of other people to my life being in my own hands. And that's sort of terrifying on one, one side of the coin and it's thrilling on the other. If you fast forward to today, the tools that we have at our disposal as an individual are just so far beyond anything I could have imagined back in that day. And what Laura is gonna talk to you about is about being an entrepreneur and in introducing these things. So Laura, can you, um, is your microphone still on? Okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, I'm going to get started here, and I want to start off by introducing our guest, who has, a, like I said, a great presentation for us. And Laura Bush is our guest today, and I've got a handy little uh, intro to who she is. And brace yourself, because you're going to be jealous immediately. So Laura is the author of Lean Branding and Powering Content, and her approach to brand design is very holistic. She, she combines insights from her undergraduate degree in business, so she took obviously far more classes than I. And she also combines that with a master's degree in design management, and further still, she combines it with a PhD in consumer psychology, which is a absolutely fascinating field. And she's a brand content strategist at Creative Market, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later, and she shares her branding and tips at uh, laurabush.com slash blog. And also, you can find her on Instagram at uh, Laura Bush. So I would definitely sign up to, uh, to get those, both of those feeds because uh, her tips are pretty intriguing. And again, this speaks to exactly what all of us, anyone who's, who's going into the world as a creative today, this, uh, this information is absolutely critical. Now, right before we start, I just want to mention one thing, that yes, this will be recorded and posted on YouTube. And two, please, during the time that Laura's giving her presentation, on the chat on the right-hand side, please write in your questions because we will address as many of those as we can when we get to the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I want to introduce Laura and say thank you for being a part of our webinar today. No, thank you for inviting me, and thanks, everyone, for being here this morning. Uh, as Dan just said, my name is Laura, and I'm excited to be sharing this information with you um, I think that even more than just 
you know, insights around branding or definitions, what I'm truly here to share with you guys is a path to building your own brand as a creative entrepreneur. So whatever idea you have, uh, whatever project you're building, I think you're in the right place. And I think you'll find that many of these tactics that we're going to talk about uh, don't require uh, many more resources or time than you already have. So I'm just really excited uh, to be collaborating with Blurb today. And also just wanted to let you guys know that the chat that you see next to you is absolutely open for any questions you might have. Um, and even if you just want to uh, share something with the group, you know, that's exactly what the chat is for. So um, having said that, uh, let's just get into it. Uh, Dan just shared a little bit about me, but this morning it's not about me, it's about you and your projects. Uh, the only reason uh, my background kind of matters in this situation is because it affects the way I talk about branding. So I don't just see branding or brand building from a business perspective or a uh, just a psychological perspective, or even design thinking. I tend to combine those three sources in all the different strategies that I talk about. And so over time, what I've found is that business, uh, and, and this is kind of just a negative note on my undergrad degree, business tends to see branding as this intangible asset. So something you can't touch. You can't feel, you can't experience. And when I finished uh, just my studies in branding from that perspective, I was lacking something. I knew there was something symbolic. There was a lot of symbolic meaning in branding and I wanted to study more of that. So that's when I got in touch with the design world. And, and that just opened my eyes to a new reality, which is behind every brand, there are so many associations being built uh, which you are building, you know, even as I speak right now, uh, everything you've shared so far about your brand on social media, on your website, on your blog, person to person, in conferences, all of this, all of these messages come together and shape this, uh, this brand image that you're sharing out with the world. So design definitely shed light on that other aspect of branding that seems more tangible. And then the last aspect, with, which was um, consumer psychology, it just allowed me to go deeper into why that's the case. You know, like, why do people shape these associations and how can we strengthen them? And how can we uh, sort of tell these stories in a way that is highly empathetic with what people need is, is how I would um, express it. So let's get right into it. Um, if, is anyone having trouble seeing the slides or is it a-okay? Yeah, if people can just write in and make sure that they can see the present. All good. All right. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Perfect. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you were all seeing the pizza. It's really important. Oh, pizza. <laughs> okay. Um, so, as I said, business tends to see branding as this intangible. Hmm. I saw that. Business tends to see... Uh, branding as this intangible kind of asset, this abstract thing that you can't feel or experience. And I just wanted to kind of ask you guys to think about that last experience that you had with a brand where things didn't go out as planned. So maybe the product uh, had a defect or maybe uh, you, know, you bought some apparel and the thread just completely came off. And you were left um, with this product that couldn't be used, or maybe it was just the pizza that got delivered to you was cold. And all of these different situations, all these different experiences shaped your perspective of the brand. And they were definitely tangible. You could definitely taste that cold pizza. You could definitely feel uh, just the broken fabric against your skin. You could definitely, uh, feel the pain of having software, for example, that wasn't doing what you wanted it to do. So all of these are very uh, real experiences. So I wanted to put that out there first, but I also wanna show you guys how this works so you can experience it on your own. So can uh, some of you just share the first word that comes to mind when you see this screen? So first word. That's... Uh... <clears throat> Chloe and I are on the same page. Whopper. <laughs> oh, yep. 
fast food. Good. Anything else? Aside meat. From Whopper. Meat, okay. burger. Food wrapped in paper, yuck. <laughs> um, perfect, okay. There's all kinds of associations. So people immediately just recall a million different things around this image that I'm showing you. And this is the most common association, I won't lie. Uh, most people just immediately go to a place where they think about the food, they think about the wrapping, uh, the ingredients even. Um, some people even think about competitors, oddly enough. So just a competitor brand will come to mind when you see the logo that I just showed you. All of this is to say that nobody, and you can go back to the chat window if you really want to make sure of this, nobody talks about the color palette, nobody talks about the vectors, nobody talks about the shapes. This, is, this was really strange to me when I first started studying this subject because we put so much emphasis on the visual symbols that sometimes we forget that at the heart of a brand is the story that we recall as consumers when we think about the brand. So there's so many different aspects involved, right? You can already start you know, remembering ads that you've seen in relation to this brand, uh, the last location where you had this burger. You can even remember like special chairs or special um, malls where you've had um, a Burger King burger before. Or you can, some people will even remember very clearly the person who served them, their last Whopper, for example. So that's thinking about service. And, and like I said before, you know, the, the emphasis that we place on some of the visual elements, you know, they shouldn't take up all of our brand thinking. And you'll, you'll um, hear more about this in a few minutes, but I just wanted to start out with this because in order to truly shape a brand that your consumers, your audience relates to, we're gonna have to go back to storytelling as the heart of the brand, okay? So this is just a reiteration of what I just said. Um, a brand is the story that consumers recall when they think of you. And yes, visual symbols are important because visual symbols help us reinforce this story, remember this story, represent this story visually. And then there's also a third component, which is the strategy. So story, symbols, strategy. And then without a strategy, you could have the best story on earth or you could have the best visual symbols by the best agency and uh, you would struggle to share this story. There would be a problem. Uh, so let's just say that the three components have to act at once for this, for this brand strategy to truly work. So let's go into what makes a successful brand story. And can you all see this diagram? Is this? Mm -hmm. is this I can see, yeah. Perfect. Okay. So I just said that a brand is a story that takes, uh, that allows us to connect with consumers deepest needs and desires. But how does that exactly happen? So when you think of a successful brand story, you have to think about a shortcut. So any successful brand is just a shortcut that allows a consumer to go from the current state, so where they are right now, what they have right now, to an ideal state, which is where they wanna be in the future. So if we remember this, we are always gonna be able to connect with our consumer at any point in time. This is very important. Um, let's take a look at this. This is one of the biggest kind of challenges that I face when working with entrepreneurs, and you may have even faced this yourself in the process of building a brand. You think that because there's a low budget, or there's limited amount of resources, then you can't, uh, you can't consider the branding process. You can't, uh, you have to, you, you tend to think that this is something that's beyond you. And I just want to immediately uh, kind of reject uh, this way of thinking because if any if uh, history has taught us anything it's that a great idea with a strong story and a real connection a strong connection to that ideal state that consumers aspire to is what determines brand success in the long run so if, if we go back 
to even the history of a company like Google, we can easily discover that, you know, it, one of Google's co-founders wasn't thinking about you know, brand story or brand strategy or even hiring an agency when he took GIMP, which is a really old vector graphics software. Some of you might remember it. It's a free vector graphics software. And he just quickly put together the initial Google logo, which over time, and yes, with a lot of customer discovery and more resources, eventually developed in what we see today. But this is proof that branding can be lean, that you can start small and iterate and evolve and learn from your market. And this is actually something you should do. You know, we should never go into this thinking that we know everything there is to be known about our consumers. So just an active learning mode is very important. And this is what I'll share just from this point onward uh, until the end of the presentation. It's just 10 tactics. So like I shared before, we tend to focus on brand symbols as if they were the single most important part of the brand. But actually brands are made up of these three components that I've um, explained before. It starts out with a value story, then this story is reinforced and communicated through these visual symbols, and then the brand strategy kind of helps us communicate that message in various different channels. So you'll find tactics for each of these three different components and for a total of 10. I will say that if you are taking notes, uh, this is gonna feel maybe just a little bit faster than the first part of the presentation. So I'd urge you to just you know, pay a lot of attention moving forward. Because remember, it also is recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again later. True, true. Yeah. So let's start with the brand story and the tactics related to brand story. Here's the first tool that I wanna share with, uh, with you guys this morning. And it's a tool that I've always found really helpful for those cases of, I can't tell a story, I don't know how to, uh, how to even start, like this is not something I'm good at, I can't do writing. These, there are just so many different challenges that people face when they get started with their brand story that I created this template to precisely help you organize your thinking. So going back to that user, which, who is you know, our main concern as we build a brand, Remember how we're trying to help him or her go from an actual state to an ideal state, which is their desired, you know, where they want to be, their desired position. Um, it, it all starts out with once upon a time. So just imagine in this first uh, stage, what you're going to do is you're going to describe who this person is. So who is your target audience? So once upon a time, and I'll share an example in a second, uh, but this is all about describing your ideal persona. And then in the second scene, you will describe some of the common activities that this person does just in the everyday. So where does he or she go? Uh, what challenges does he or she face? Uh, but then in the middle of those daily tasks, there's a problem. You know, there's, there's a moment of pain. And that is uh, what the third scene is all about. So this person had an issue and that's the place to describe it. It's the main pain point. And then we go into the fourth scene, which is how he or she tried to solve this pain point. And if the problem that your product or service is targeting is a real problem, then there's an alternative solution for it. So there's already a way in which the customer is trying to solve it, ideally. This is very important because, you know, as we identify what that central problem or desire that our brand satisfies is, we forget that when these problems or these desires are real, consumers are not going to just be sitting there waiting for a solution. They have probably already found an alternative. So it's very important to understand that those alternatives are already out there. Now in the fifth scene, um, there's something lacking. So this solution that they have isn't perfect. No solution is. So he or she wished that if there was an additional you know, extra value to that, to that problem solver, solver that they currently had. And that's where you get in. So in the scene that says, until one day, that's when you'll describe just when it, it is that this person, this ideal consumer, gets to know about your brand. 
So is it through an ad? Is it through a friend that told them about it? So how do they meet you for the very first time? And then unlike his or her old solution, which you know, you'll describe what the difference is between this new solution that you bring versus the alternative that the person was already using, um, you know, your brand does so and so differently or better. And finally, just like every story, you want to round it up saying uh, what wish came true through the whole process. So this is the actual wish or desire or problem resolution that your product satisfied at the end. So let's just quickly look at an example of what this looks like with a wedding planning brand. So if this is your brand, then it's, it's right on for you. Once upon a time, uh, there was this woman who got engaged. She was going to marry the love of her life. She always uh, talked to her friends very in a very excited you know, way about the event that was coming up. So she knew she was really excited about her wedding day, and she had some ideas that she wanted to bring to life. But she had a problem uh, just trying to put all the pieces together. So logistics, you know, um, even things like gifts for guests and um, apparel. There's all kinds of considerations as you're uh, planning a wedding. So that was her key problem. But she tried to solve it um, by hiring a wedding planner. So, you know, she had heard from her friends that there was this person in her town that, you know, could help her out just making a checklist, helping her, guiding her through the checklist so she could organize her event in a much more efficient way. Now, she wished there was a more optimal way for her to, you know, from her office, remotely, whenever she had time, work with a wedding planner or, or some kind of wedding planning service uh, that made life much easier for her without meeting in person, without having to spend all that time. So one day she saw an ad, um, and this ad uh, was placed probably in Instagram or in Facebook. With your story, you can get a lot more specific because you know exactly how it is that people get to know you, um, or what your most effective channel is at least. So one day they saw an ad, and through this ad, um, this bride-to-be, learned about a service that was actually a team. It was a company that had an app that allowed her to plan her wedding in a much more effective way. So unlike her old solution, she could plan her wedding in her own time from wherever she was, um, working with from her phone, um, and leaving it all to her wedding planning team. And finally, her wish came true, which was to have an event that she could enjoy uh, without having to invest, you know, a time that she did not have or an amount of resources that she did not have. So this was the wish came, um, coming to reality. That's an example that you can uh, just use as you kind of learn how to use this tool. Here's just uh, an entrepreneur using this tool a couple of years ago. It's something I've used repeatedly and found that it's really effective, especially when you're starting from scratch, essentially. Now the second tactic here uh, is a word association exercise. So put your brand at the center of a diagram like this. Just, you know what the name of your brand is. And actually, I'll say at this point that if you want to share your brand and any links that you might have for other attendees in this webinar to follow, by all means, do that in the chat window. Um, so that said, just place your brand at the center of this um, diagram and start finding words that are associated with it. So, and this is similar to the exercise that I did with you guys with the burger, um, but obviously you can go more in depth with your own brand. And here's an example with a brand that's about education. So the name is Teach Stars and then all around it, you'll find associations with K through 12 education. So classroom, school, students, grades, you, you can even get into the more tangible objects like a desk or uh, more intangible concepts like wisdom. You can, you can go as far as you want with these uh, words. But what it will allow you to do is find those terms that are already just by default uh, creating a link with your brand name, with your selected brand name. And sometimes you'll find this is positive. Sometimes you'll find that there are some negative associations that you need to work with uh, or 
better yet, work to uh, diminish if they are negative. Uh, you need to just find a strategy to play around that and move around that. Um, here's just an example of the exercise being uh, performed. You can do this you know, online, you can do it physically with post-it notes, whatever your preference is, it's still a great way to validate your brand name and see what kinds of associations it triggers. Um, the third tool is the positioning map. So if you've been in the business world or studied business at one point, uh, you may have seen this. It's a map that allows you to understand where your brand fits in a series of variables. So in this case, we have compatibility and price as variables. Um, and the way this works is we're looking at the software tool at, at the office software tool space. So think about tools that allow you to work with docs, right? And the more you go to the left, just the, uh, are, can you all hear me correctly? The more you go to the left, um, yeah, and you can, you can shape these axes however way you want. So you can set price being you know, cheaper at the top or cheaper at the bottom, um, and compatibility just being more compatible at the left or more compatible at the right. In my case, I did compatibility is going, is going to be more compatible at the left, and price is going to be lowest at the top. Because what I'm looking at, ideally, is the most compatible and most cost-effective tool. That's the one that I want to visualize and then compare myself with it. So if you think about it that way, then Google Docs is highly compatible. You can open it in almost any device, and it's free to use. Whereas um, Apple's, uh, soft, uh, Apple's um, document management tools like Numbers and um, you know, pages and those kinds of tools and apps are made specifically for um, Mac devices and they're more costly, especially if you compare them with Google Docs. So that's an example. Um, let's now look at this positioning template, which is also something you may have seen uh, if you're in the business world or the startup world. Uh, once you've determined, you know, which space you occupy in this whole positioning map, it can be helpful to put it in words. So you know who your competitors are, but here's a chance to actually verbalize that. So for target customer who need whatever it is they need, your brand, which is you know just a brand name, is A, and then you'll list uh, the product category that it fits. So if it's an app, if it's a service, if it's um, a jewelry brand, or you know. Where whatever category it fits in, you'll list it here. Um, then you'll list the main benefits. So what's the core value that you're offering? Again, going back to that whole idea of, of how are you taking consumers to their ideal state versus their current state. Unlike your competitor or your main competitor, uh, this product that you are um, developing, this brand that you're developing, and you'll repeat the name here, does so-and-so differently. And this is very abstract right now, so let's look at an example um, that will hopefully shed some light on this. So let's look at um, Blurb, an example with Blurb in this case. Here's how Blurb would probably be, um, fill out a template like this. So for authors, creative professionals, and small businesses who want to bring their publication ideas to life, for example, Blurb is a platform form that offers tools to create, print, and publish independent books. And then they could go into the other part of saying how they're different from their competitors. But here's the central positioning statement that they would definitely want to keep front and center. And so here's an example with Creative Market 2, for those of you who, who know about the site, uh, for creative professionals who want to bring their design projects to life, Creative Market is an online marketplace that offers ready-to-use assets from independent creators around the world. I would love for you right now to kind of place your brand in wherever you see Creative Market or Blurb and try to use this template to summarize what it is that makes your brand different. I think you'll find that in summarizing it, you just get a lot more clarity as to what that is. 
So it's an exercise that I would urge you to complete whenever you have time. Here's a fifth tactic, um, ethnography. And if you're in the design world, this is a word you may have heard. Uh, also, if you're in the social sciences world, it's a research technique that is used um, in both spaces. So by designers, by social scientists, like anthropologists. And it sounds like a very complex word, but in reality, it's very, very human. It's probably one of the most human forms of research. Ethnography is all about observation. So going back to that story, you will never find that core value or that core benefit to be able to refine it unless you know a lot about your, your end user, unless you know a lot about your target audience. And so ethnography, there's many different techniques for ethnography, but I would suggest in a first stage, just go to the place where your, your users, your ideal users live, go to the place where they work, and start observing. You know, make a note of the tools that they use, the problems that they face, uh, the different uh, schedules that are part of their day, um, all the different uh, both wins and losses and pains that they can face in an average day or average week. Like the closer you get to the people that you're creating for, just the more, uh, the better your story will resonate with them once you start sharing it. Sometimes we create these stories and like hypothetical scenarios and then we go and share them with the people that we're creating for it. And there's, there's no alignment. And, and that is partially our fault because we haven't necessarily gone, gone into their space, gone into their world and learned all there is to learn about them. So activities, tools, interactions, just make a note of everything that shapes uh, how they live or how they work depending on the product you're building. Um, and now let's look just at a couple of tactics related to brand symbols. So the ones that I've talked about that about so far are all related to brand story. So we're now getting into design, the more um, symbolic representation of that story. And so my first tactic that I would love for all of you to try at least once, if you haven't already, is to conduct a visual audit. And this means many different things, but let's just make it simple. Uh, what I'd love for you guys to help me here. What do you associate with the symbol on the left? So the ball, why does that bring to mind? Beach, good one, beach. Anything else? Beach. <laughs> Kids, okay, propeller, that's good. Inflatable, childhood, that's a good one. Summer, water, ball, okay. And then with the image to the right, so the fire. Flame, barbecue, that's interesting. Danger. Back, back that's blaze, good. that's funny, Andy. Barbecue again. And we already start to see how, how these apparently minimal, super minimal um, icons in black and white, not a lot, like there's no color in here to interfere with the associations that you guys are, are uh, mentioning. There's just the concept, right? There's just the idea of a ball and the idea of fire. And that in and of itself has triggered all of these different associations with things like the beach or seasons like summer or even uh, something as um, direct a concept as specific as danger, which, you know, if you think about these symbols as starting points for any brand, you can already start to see how these add meaning. They add a layer of meaning to what you're trying to say. So that's why we start with the story and then we get into symbols. And, and this is the exact same process that I would urge you to take when you're building your own brand. Because starting the other way around, prioritizing or like believing that branding is centered on the vectors or the color palettes is fundamentally misunderstanding that our role as brand builders is to provide value 
for human beings. And so we start with the value first, story first, and then that story dictates the symbols. So running a quick visual audit will help you understand precisely you know, what, what are these symbols even saying about our story? So it's, it's an interesting exercise. And if you wanna conduct it and get more specific symbols or more detailed symbols, because I know that I used like black and white, just very stripped down um, images. You can also look at more elaborate, um, uh, more elaborate uh, images and vectors, running a search on a site like Creative Market. So you can search for something like plants and you can already start to see how the different layers of color and texture and um, even you know things like typographies start to play with these very basic symbols to create layers of meaning. So this is a good exercise to start out with. And this would be a visual audit from your side, but I would also suggest doing a visual audit that's more competitive in nature. So if I were to launch a new fast food brand, I would definitely search for all of the most important fast food brands that are competing with mine in my same space and look at how they are being projected visually to understand you know, if there are trends. Um, I don't know if you guys can see any trends even in the slide that I'm showing right now, but there are some clear patterns here around color and type. Um, uh, colors like red and yellow, for example, that emphasize speed are often used um, in conjunction with fast food brands because they kind of simulate that whole you know, sit down, order, leave kind of dynamic. Hey, Laura, um, just, so, just so you know, we have about 10 minutes left. Got it. Yeah, well, we're good. So we're almost okay. done here. Um, with the seventh tactic, what I want to share with you is that you don't have to know it all. You know, there's this visual audit that you've conducted, but it doesn't, you don't have to rely on yourself to make these calls, to like decide, you know, which of these symbols better represents uh, danger or which of these symbols better represents quality. You can always go back and ask. And there are lots of tools to conduct A-B testing. Here's just one uh, that actually allows you to test both copy and images or anything else you want. Um, they ask, you know, which logo feels more trustworthy? And that's just a sample question, but you could show two different examples and ask people uh, for their answer and then for why they selected that answer. You can do this not only on online, you can also do it physically with a group of people. Just show them two different versions of what you believe to be viable options for your brand. This could be for logos, this could be for uh, your website, this could be for you know print pieces. Um, and just really inquire as to what are they associating with these different options and which one you should go with based on their feedback. Um, the eighth tactic that I wanted to mention, and this is also along the lines of you do not have to do this alone. You do not have to start from scratch. Uh, there's a well-known uh, challenge in the creative world uh, called the blank canvas syndrome. I, I don't know if you've ever uh, encountered it, but it can be very frustrating to just start out with a blank canvas and not know where to go from there. It can be very blocking. So. That's where um, a site like Creative Market can add um, a lot of value because you can find independent designers from different countries around the world that have different areas of expertise, which is what you find in the real world anyway. You know, in, in the agency world, when you're building, when you're um, completing a branding project, you will always have to find someone who's an expert in type design, someone who's an expert in, in illustration, and you'll have to collaborate. So what a site like Creative Market does is it makes all of these resources easily available. And by resources, I just mean things like fonts, like business card templates, like brochure templates, um, your letterhead, or even color palettes, or something as basic as, you know, I have an idea for my logo, but I don't know how to put the type and a symbol together. So those lockups are also, you know, you can get uh, really inspired just looking at templates. Um, that's another one of my tactics that I wanted to share. And then the last two tactics have to do with the strategy. So we've gone 
from story to symbols to strategy. And then this is the last component, which will allow you to effectively share this story and these symbols with the right audience. So we have social media management tools, which some of you might be familiar with, um, tools like Hootsuite, Buffer, that essentially allow you to block your social media scheduling in the time that works best for you and then uh, roll out that content in the time that works best for your audience. So it's kind of like this asynchronous um, setup where you, know, you batch upload the content and then they'll receive it whenever it's optimal for them to see it. It's really effective. And then the last tactic I wanted to share with you today um, are the influencer platforms. You can either work directly with influencers, which is a rising trend, or you can use a tool like Activate, uh, which is former blog lovin, or there are dozens of, of uh, influencer platforms these days, and I would urge you to at least take a look at what's out there, at least you know, browse and understand who is uh, leading thought in your space, in your brand space, and try to share that story that we've been talking about all along uh, through the voices that are best respected in your industry. So that would be influencer marketing. And so having said that, um, I think I just invite you to check out some of the resources um, that I've mentioned that are available at Creative Market. And um, back to you, Dan. Awesome. Okay, let me uh, let me size these up a little bit. I'm going to stop uh, stop the presentation. Yes, and we are back. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me just fine. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. That was wonderful. I made a uh, ton of notes myself to go through. Uh, I always have a lot of uh, a lot of help I need on my own branding as well. So for those of you who don't know, I work full time for Blurb, obviously, but also on the side, I've been involved in a variety of different projects. And again, speaking to the way the world works today, so much of this is in my own hands that I can design and develop anything I want, put it out into the world without anybody ha telling me what I have to do. And again, that's that's sort of the uh, the catch twenty two of yes, this is really wonderful, but also I've got so much uh, on my on my plate. So there were a couple a couple of questions that came in that I thought were pretty interesting. And one, this happened to me a long time ago when I was a photographer and I was actually photographing two different things professionally but they were two very different genres. And one of the genres did not play well with the other. So I ended up having to make two websites and two brands and two separate identities, which was so much work and so much of a hassle. But I realized I didn't have any way around it because one of one set of clients didn't want to see me in another way. So someone wrote in and said, if you're both a designer and a photographer, mm -hmm. would you separate those when it comes to the branding and the selling process? Well, do you have something you'd like to, being a photographer, is there something you'd like to bring up there? If not, I can take it away. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, that's, that for you, I was, I'm, I'm asking the question, I'm reading their question to you okay. because I, because I know how it, with photography, it's, it's such a specific field where, yes, if you're, if you're, a, for example, if you're a wedding photographer, but you also mm -hmm. shoot advertising and commercial work. Oftentimes, advertising and commercial clients do not want to know the fact that you shoot weddings mm -hmm. because there's still a, a stigma associated with the wedding field because historically, photographers that couldn't necessarily do anything else in photography ended up photographing weddings. That is not mm -hmm. true anymore and hasn't been true for a long time. There's a lot of really talented right. people shooting weddings, <clears throat> but there's still a stigma. So mm -hmm. if, I, if I was doing that today, I would have separate sites and separate brands mm -hmm. for those two things. But in any other, whether it's a jewelry business or whatever, then I don't know. What do you think? Okay, I got it. Um, so my first question to, I guess I'd have a, a follow-up follow question for this person, but if you are in the situation, uh, you know, if even if you're not a photographer, you might be facing this as a designer, you might be facing this as a writer. Like you have one career that uh, has a given space and then you have your personal brand kind of going on you know, in, a, in a different lane. Um, what we've seen increasingly nowadays is this idea of multi-passionate entrepreneurs merging their uh, all of their story in a single narrative. So. Perhaps what you're using for your personal brand right now, uh, the passions, the hobbies that you have, make 
your photography career that much more interesting. So it's up to you to kind of understand uh, what it is about your personal life or about your personal inclinations that shapes your career differently. And then you have to leverage that. So I think we're past, we're past the era where people um, kind of conformed to a general narrative about careers. I think not like I haven't, I've never met one engineer that's exactly like the next in my life. I had never, I have never met a photographer that's exactly like the next. And I think that's, that's the beauty of it almost. Like as more and more tasks get automated uh, and there's gonna be a lot more that gets automated in the next 10 years. Uh, what we're gonna see is the value of the human difference and the value of that that makes you unique. So the challenge as with everything is just finding the right balance. Like how much of this part of me do I put out there and how much of my more professional voice comes out. Um, but I would never speak in favor of kind of uh, quieting your more creative side or your more passionate side uh, in favor of a more technical or objective kind of presence. I would always favor, you know, different. I think, I think that's an interesting point because back in the day, there was far less of a story being told about the people who were actually making the work, the creatives themselves. You put a, you put a site online and it was your portfolio and clients would go and they would literally spend 30 seconds determining whether or not you were a valid person or an invalid person, basically. But today, what started, if you go all the way back, and I remember the very first time I ever heard the word blog. And I remember where I was and who was doing it. And it was a 15 year old kid who was doing design work for some of the biggest companies in the world at 15 years old because he had taught himself coding long before anybody I even knew what coding was. And he started blogging. And I remember asking the guy next to me who ended up being the man who developed the, plat the blogger platform. I said, what's a blog? And he said, have you ever written, it, written in a journal? And I said, yeah, I write in a journal every day. He said, it's the exact same thing, but it's online. And that was sort of the first crack into people sharing more of who they were as part of their brand experience than just their work itself. And I think to your point, if it's authentic and it's original, and I think the precipice that we're at right now is with some of the branding and marketing that we've seen over the last 10 years, there's, there's, a, there's brands that are very authentic and there are mm -hmm. brands that are not authentic at all and everyone is starting to be able to see through those things. So yeah. I love I love the idea of telling the entire story, not being afraid to say, look, this is who I am. This is my personal life, my professional life. It's blended together because ultimately, and I learned this as a photographer years ago, that when people would buy a print from me, I kept hearing the same expression from people that bought a print was that they were more interested in sort of not just the photograph itself, but also the story behind it and my mm -hmm. connection to why that picture was actually made in the first place. So I think to your point, you're right. The next 10 years, I think it's going to be more important. The one thing from my perspective is this, the, the question that every creative has to ask themselves is one, how much do you want to share mm -hmm. and how honest you're going to be? Because I love to, share things that maybe, you know, oh, I, I did a shoot, but I didn't do that well. And people say, oh, you can't say that. But I think you can because I think clients appreciate the authenticity. Agreed, 100%. And authenticity so, is the current. Oh, go ahead, now. go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you were breaking up right there. You, go ahead. Uh, I just said authenticity is the new currency for online communication. People can see right through a generic statement or a neutral position on something that is very clearly a value of the company. So even in this political scene, we've just seen more and more brands come forward and, you know, voicing their position on harsh topics like never before. And there's a question, uh, if we as individuals face that dilemma of like, should we be truly authentic and say and do as we do in our regular life with our uh, business brands. Uh, that's also true for groups of human beings, which is companies. So at the end of the day, uh, brands are made by and for human beings. And, and the more, the closer they get to that reality, the more genuine they feel. 
Uh, excellent. So we have a question from Christian that just came in, Kristen, which is how to reach uh, with your service or your product, how to reach a larger target audience? Because she said sometimes the target group is not that small. And for example, it could be, okay, I want to reach 14 to 28 year olds, um, which targets a lot of different kinds of people. So what's the best way to reach that larger demographic? Let's see. So 14 to 28 years old. Okay, I see. Huh. I'm re just Magic. reading the question. How to... How to reach your uh, how to reach with a product a large target audience? Sometimes the target group is not so small, and it can be from which targets? Okay, I see. So, as with uh, everything in marketing, uh, you're going to find that segmentation is your friend. With the way in which you use your resources, uh, is going to be heavily impacted by your ability to pick your battles. So, even if you have a big big market that's addressable, like you know you can reach them. You know you could, if you really tried, if you really invested all you had, you could reach them. Um, the big decision in marketing is not who I can potentially reach, but who I am making it my intention or my focus or my target to reach. And those target segments can change over time. So Facebook started out with college students, and that was a very kind of narrow um, audience if you think about who they reach now. Like now Facebook reaches everyone Everybody. and their mom and their grandma and like probably their pet someday. It's, it's crazy just how they've kind of gone from this very small group of college students, Harvard and Stanford and like a couple more schools, to a more general population. So it's a matter of finding who your target segment is going to be for the different stages of your business. If you know that your business has potential to be uh, globally adopted and it has like this very massive appeal to it, it's still a matter of prioritization. There's a high chance your resources aren't unlimited. And so in that scenario, you're better off selecting an audience of uh, users that are sometimes called in the tech world early adopters, if, if you're just getting started, you can just choose a small group that is very passionate about your product, about your brand, and then they help you spread the word. And eventually, you know, as you go down the road, you will uh, enlarge that audience. But you need to start with those that are more fiercely passionate about your product and are willing to share about it, is, is what I would um, recommend in her case. Okay. And I think we have time for one more question. And that question would be, uh, which I think is a good one. There's a lot of people who are new to having their own brand or as, as an individual, they're starting to realize that they are the brand. And you, you hit on this earlier, but maybe we could flush it out a little, which is I don't have a lot of money and I would, I want to look and seem professional with my marketing and branding, but what, how do I do that without investing too much time, money, resources? Is there any sort of initial step that people can take to sort of go down the right path? Definitely. And, and you got that right. The inspiration behind this whole idea of building a lean brand and lean branding is precisely, you know, that visionary that has an idea doesn't necessarily have the same amount of resources as their top competitor. So uh, to your question, starting point. Uh, and it just kind of kind of also flows along with the presentation. Your starting point should always be the story. So that first um, storyboard that I shared with the different scenes, I would start out with that exercise and try to discover what your central narrative is. So how do you see this brand solving or, or satisfying uh, a need or desire for this uh, ideal persona? Once you have clarity on that, uh, and, and only after you have clarity on that, I would go into the next step of looking at visual symbols, which I guess is, is where this person is going out with, you know, that's expensive or I don't know where to start. So here's the thing. Do that visual audit that I recommended. Um, take some of the central words in your story, some of the central values, and run a visual search around the, the concepts, the, the objects that can help you illustrate that and come up with like just a small folder or like library of 
uh, icons and objects and uh, different shapes that can help you represent that. Um, then run the same kind of visual audit for your competitive space and understand you know, if there are patterns, if there are different um, considerations that you should take into account to differentiate yourself from what's already out there. And only then, uh, there are kind of two big roads here, the DIY road or the hire someone road. I'm sensing that this person wants to go the DIY road mm -hmm. uh, or has resources to go the DIY road, which is perfectly valid. Like I said, big companies have done it. Google, Twitter, list goes on. So then I would go into a site like creativemarket.com and search for those templates, for those kind of ready to tweak or ready to modify assets that can help you get a start. You know, this is about starting. And once you start, you're going to start hearing more about your audience. You're going to start learning more about them and your visuals, your story, your strategy are all going to evolve. The problem here is thinking that you need to launch with something that doesn't change over time. You know, the whole idea of a minimum viable product or, you know, likewise, a minimum viable brand is go out, test this out, see what feedback you get, evolve, improve, iterate. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. That is all the time we are going to have today for questions and for uh, this webinar in particular. Again, it will be recorded and will be posted on the Blurb YouTube channel so that you can watch it as many times as you want to watch it. And I encourage you to watch it at least 10, 20, 30 times. So thank you to Laura for, uh, for coming on with us today. And uh, thanks to the Blurb staff in the background who is uh, working away and we will see you in a, a month or so with the next word, uh, next webinar. But Laura, thank you so much for joining in today. Thank you guys uh, for this space and thanks to everyone who could make it. Uh, if you guys have any questions, you can always reach, um, reach out to me at Laura B U S C H E. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And we will see you in uh, a month.